as we join in the Lord's mission and build his kingdom around the world, we have to hold two truths in balance. God is all-powerful. We can have complete confidence in him. At the other end of the scale, we have to know our weakness and reliance on him. When Dr. Pam Arlen talks with potential missionaries, she looks for someone aware of God's strength and aware of their own weakness. Yeah, when I talk to young people and have early conversations, I honestly want to hear a little bit of fear and not a lot of fear that keeps them from moving forward, but I don't want them to to be so self-assured that they're not relying on Christ. And so I want to hear like, I think I want to do this, but I'm a little bit intimidated by this. And I was like, all right, that's exactly the right place to be. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton, and I'm in the studio today in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, with Dr. Pam Arlen. She is the Global Training and Research Leader for All Nations International, and we will talk a little bit about what they do, what she does. She also is a veteran missionary, having served in Central Asia for 10 years. She's been involved in Bible translation. She's been involved in church planting, so a wealth of experience. Dr. Pam, welcome to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. We are happy that you are here as well. Let's go back to the very beginning to start out. Can can you talk a little bit or, or share the story of how God called you from comfortable American life to go to the far reaches of the world? I think it actually started when I heard about a guy named Hudson Taylor, and I realized he had this vision from the Lord to take the gospel to the inland parts of China. And I started looking up a map uh, to see where there were believers in China, and I realized there were still a lot of believers on the coast and a lot of missionaries on the coast, but almost none inland. And I thought, how can this be literally hundreds of years after Hudson Taylor had this vision from the Lord? How can that still be true? And I thought that picture that Hudson Taylor had was from the Lord, and that's a multi-generational endeavor. And it has come to my generation, and will my generation step up? So you packed up and you moved to Western China. You didn't take a sort of a scouting trip. You just got your suitcases and moved there. How hard was that transition? How hard was it to to sort of just land there and say, okay, this is home now. (laughs) This is where God has called me. What were the difficulties? Yeah, actually, that, that was really hard. I had never left the United States. And people criticized me saying, how can you possibly think that you're going to go live on the China, Afghanistan, Pakistan border if you've never left the United States? How do you know you're going to make it? And I said, well, I honestly don't know if I'm going to make it. But what I do know is that Jesus said go and that Jesus said it'll be hard. And so I assume it'll be hard. I assume it'll be really difficult. And I assume that somewhere in the middle of that, Jesus and I will wrestle it out and he will be enough. People have heard of the Uyghurs as a people group, as being a highly persecuted Muslim people group. Um, In case people don't know, uh, the Chinese government harvests their organs. They put them in concentration camps. And at the time that I went out to where the Uyghurs live in 1996, the day I was supposed to arrive in the province, I think roughly 3,000 Uyghurs were executed on that day. Wow. And I started getting sick, you know, to be really honest. Yeah, I was under a lot of stress, and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it. When you take away all of those supports that we're used to having, and Hudson Taylor talked about this, right? He talked about one of the joys of being a missionary is also one of the hardest things of being a missionary. You no longer have your language, your food, your clothing, or your family to rely on, and you find out, are you really totally in Christ or not? And so over the course of those first few years on the field, missionaries typically become really close to Jesus or get really cranky, and sometimes both at the same time. And so I went through those difficult, cranky years where I was working with the Lord, but he and I got really intimate in that time too. So I just feel so grateful to have had the opportunity to experience that with Jesus. 
We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Dr. Pam Arlen. She is the Global Training and Research Leader for All Nations International. You can find their website, by the way, allnations.international, just just like their name. How difficult was it for you as a single woman being in a Muslim context and doing life, doing ministry, trying to make relationships, trying to lead people to Christ? How, How difficult was that? Yeah, that's a great question. There are a lot of challenges to being a single female, but the Lord has reminded me that we have this privileged position on earth because we are vulnerable, which means we get to be intimate with Jesus in a special way. And actually, the kind of Muslims I worked with had better schools for girls than for boys, and they also had women who were mayors of their towns. Wow. And so we have to remember that the world of Islam is very diverse. But they embraced me as a university professor and as an educated woman, and I was able to sit with both men and women and teach them the joy of following Jesus. One of the things that you write about and that you use in your training is is something you call ability-focused training. So it's not just let's fill your mind with all this information. It is let's give you a skill that actually means something when you get to the field. Talk a little bit about that and how it's different from maybe some of the other modes of training that are more sort of knowledge-based. Right. So uh, I believe in knowledge, right? Knowledge is a good thing. Uh, You have a PhD. (laughs) So I don't want people to mishear me in the things that I'm about to say. Uh, But we want to think about what all believers, not just missionaries, but all believers need to both know and do. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. You're going to actually live it out in the real world. And so we realize that just receiving knowledge is not enough. And traditional training models are kind of like you sit in a classroom and you gain knowledge for like multiple years on end. And you're not really expected to do much with it yet. Like we hope you will later, but you're going to have to figure out how to apply it later. So we give a little bit of knowledge and then application of that knowledge immediately. So it's both know and do. And it's based on if if you can do it, then we know that you have enough knowledge um, rather than kind of the other way around. One of the things that I think grows out of that is that the training is worldwide. It's applicable in Uganda just like it is in America. It's like, hey, let's go out and do this. Let, let's watch how you do this rather than just, again, you know, here's 10 books that you need to read. And then after that, we'll have a test. Yeah, right. And, and, you know, reading books is wonderful. And I hang out with a lot of people who are missiologists. And missiologists are great human beings that I love. But I don't train missiologists. I train missionaries. It's a little bit like the difference between having an electrical engineer and an electrician, right? (laughs) Electrical engineers are awesome. But if you've got a wiring problem at your house, you call an electrician, not the electrical engineer. And so I need to make sure I'm training the equivalent of of the electrician who's going to actually be able to make disciples and plant churches. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Dr. Pam Arlen. She is the Global Training and Research Leader for All Nations International. She is also the author of a brand new book called Stick Figures Save the World. And Pam, we better you better give a little bit of context for that. Stick figures save the world. Talk a little bit about the book, about what the the lessons you're trying to pass along. Yeah, and I should point out that the subtitle to Stick Figures Save the World says, actually, it's Jesus who saves the world. Um, You know, you mentioned that we have many amazing uh, believers around the world who are highly intelligent, but they have never had an opportunity for education. And I was raising up leaders who were highly intelligent, highly respected in their communities, but they didn't know how to read and write. And so how was I going to help them to learn the Bible? And that's part of my job as a Bible translator. And it occurred to me one day, the Bible does not say faith comes by reading. The Bible says faith comes by hearing. And so I needed to create a way that they could learn the stories of the Bible and pass them on accurately to other people, even though they couldn't read and write. I got frustrated and just started drawing stick figures of the story of Zacchaeus, actually, one day. And I discovered that people were gathering around me and they were interested. And with the stick figures, they would immediately turn and tell the story to somebody else accurately because it helped them to remember the story. Mm -hmm. 
it cost essentially one cent to be able to do it. And so not only did they learn the Bible better, but despite the fact that I had a master's and a PhD in linguistics, I was learning my Bible better. And so then I got really excited about this way to use stick figures to learn your Bible for everybody and anybody. So the book, again, Stick Figures Save the World, actually, the subtitle, actually, it's Jesus Who Saves the World. Dr. Pam Arland, it is available on Amazon. It's available wherever you buy books. Uh, so I would encourage you to look at that, get a copy of that. Pam, if if I come to you, Sam, I'm in my mid-20s, okay? I've, I've finished college. I've got my first job, but God has been working on me you know, maybe you need to go. Maybe you need to pack up and go to a place where the gospel's not preached. What What do you want to hear from me, or, or or what is that first conversation with you like as you start to suss out, is this really God? Is this someone who would fit in well at all nations? Is this someone who's ready to be successful on the field? What are some of the questions, or, or what are some of the things that you want to know in those early conversations? Yeah, when I talk to young people and have early conversations, I honestly want to hear a little bit of fear. <laughs> and not a lot of fear that keeps them from moving forward, but I don't want them to to be so self-assured that they're not relying on Christ. Right. And so I want to hear, like, I think I want to do this, but I'm a little bit intimidated by this. And I was like, all right, that's exactly the right place to be. And then I tell them, come come join either our community in all nations. We call ourselves a joyful global family um, or join some other missions agency. But join community that you can do this with. Uh, join people who've done it that you can get trained. Like we have a training program we call the Church Planting Experience, but other agencies have training. So make sure that you're training what you have. But also make sure that whatever gift you're bringing to the table is being developed, that you're not just being put into like this is the way all missionaries look. Um, but each person has a unique way of serving the Lord. And so, yeah, I think being willing to be a little bit scared, being willing to join community and get trained are some key concepts early on. How do you know if if they have the right amount of fear? <laughs> if, <laughs> if they're not overwhelmed by it, at the same time, they, they do know this is not going to be a walk in the park. This is going to be tough. Yeah, so how do you know you have the right amount of fear when fear basically drives you back to the feet of Jesus, but you still keep walking forward, Amen. right? Um, so when they tell me I have a lot of fear and I talk to Jesus about it, so then I took the next step and then I took the next step, that's exactly the right place to be, I think, with fear. Amen. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the fact that the training that you've developed is used in America. It's also used all around the world. How different is it to train a North American 25-year-old from a Ugandan 25-year-old or a Turkish 25-year-old or someone from the developing world? Yeah, you know, there are a lot of similarities and a lot of differences both. And the way we have worked it out is to provide some core abilities. And as long as the trainee walks away with those core abilities, we don't actually care how you got there. <laughs> um, if you can use a PowerPoint to get there like you can with a North American – although I have almost outlawed PowerPoint at this point, um, but then that's fine. But the Ugandan, maybe they get there a different way. And so actually we have leaders who, for example, train our Ugandans who are Ugandan. And so they know they've sat in on some of our other trainings. They're kind of bridge people. They learn how it works and then they adapt it and they're free to adapt it. That's part of the design mm -hmm. is that it should be adaptable in all of those places. And so um, the Ugandans, you know, have a tendency to all live in one house house together and eat their meals together. Um, and that's just really beautiful. I mean, I love watching how they do it and how they adapt it to who they are. It's really beautiful. What are some of those core abilities that, that you want them to walk out of the church planning training with? Yeah, so um, our first most important core ability is to abide with Jesus, right? You just got to know Jesus inside and out and be with him. And then the next one we have is actually to pray passionately. Uh, so th those two things are actually all believers should have those skill sets, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and then the next one I already talked about earlier is to be a healthy person on a healthy team, to be able to work with other people, uh, to honor other cultures, to be willing to go where the gospel has never been heard. And that means being willing to be inconvenienced, to go to difficult and dangerous places, the ability to share the gospel, of course, the ability to plant a church, uh, because we want to make sure we're not 
just having a few isolated believers and Bible studies are great, but Bible studies are not the end goal. Church is the end goal. What are the hardest things for, and I'm thinking particularly for North Americans, you you made the transition, you packed up and moved to Western China. You see people, you're training people to make that transition today. What are the hardest things typically, and obviously everybody's experience is somewhat unique, but what are some of the, just the really big things that people have a, a challenge of overcoming? You know, there are so many challenges once you arrive on the field, but we often don't talk about the challenges to even get to the field in the first place. Um, Not only is there training that's required uh, one way or another to take the time and the money and the effort to get that training, but then there's this support raising process that most missionaries go through that is very discouraging. And it's very frightening to think about going to your friends in your church and asking them to support you financially. And recently, I was at the the University of Alabama teaching a class there, and one of the leaders came to me and said, all of these kids that grew up in Christian homes have been told by their parents that their job is to get married, have grandchildren, and get a high-paying job. And when I train them to actually go to the mission field, it's their Christian parents who oppose them from going to the mission field. And so to have your family, even your Christian family, not be supportive of that call makes that call ever so much harder. And I think um, we've talked in the past about our founder of All Nations, Floyd McClung, when he used to do baby dedications. He would take these babies and he would hold them in his arms and he would look the parents in the eyes and he would say, when this baby grows up, if the Lord calls this child to serve in an overseas mission field, do you release them now? to the calling of the Lord on their life. And I think that that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that should be a part of every baby dedication for every Christian child that's being raised. Amen. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Dr. Pam Arlen. She is the Global Training and Research Leader for All Nations International. Their website, again, allnations.international. Pam, how do you think about, and because a part of another hat that you wear at All Nations is safety, safety and security, how do you think about sending people to places where their their lives are at risk, literally their lives are at risk? How, how do you kind of balance your, your safety hat with your gospel go into all the world hat? Yeah, how do we balance both of those hats, but... God is perfectly capable of wearing both of those hats, Uh, and we're still trying to figure it out. Honestly, I think back, and I know I keep mentioning Hudson Taylor, uh, but I have lots of missionary heroes, and Hudson Taylor is one of them. And when he was thinking about starting the China Inland Mission, he had a really famous conversation with God. And he said to the Lord, if I send them to inland China, some of them are going to die. And the Lord said to Hudson Taylor, you're right. And God said to Hudson Taylor, whether they live or whether they die, if if I, God, call them to the mission field, your job, Hudson Taylor, is to send them and to be obedient to me. And so Hudson Taylor got that settled in his heart. And I often think of that, that if God calls people to a place, then my job is to help them to get to that place. And we teach them to think through risk. And we, as a part of our training, we have several sessions where we sit down and think through different things that are risky and how do we have conversation. And that's the way we work in all nations. Let's have a conversation about it. We're not going to make a rule about what you can do or not do, but we're going to sit through and have coffee, have tea, and talk about if you do that, what does that look like and how does that feel for your family? And well, let's pause and pray about that before we decide to do that. So we work it all out in relationship and honest and open conversation rather than rules. And it's hard for me, honestly, because I love our people Mm -hmm. and I want them to not have to suffer hard things. Uh, But that's actually not ultimately my calling. And I agree that Jesus is worth it all. And so it's just honest, loving conversations that we work it out. Are there people who have a harder time with that conversation than others? And is there a is there a characteristic that makes it more difficult for some people to to kind of have that conversation? Yeah, it's definitely easier for some people than for others. Yeah. And I think if people have a low tolerance for uncertainty, then that is really hard for them to be be willing to go in and say, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. 
And when we have those conversations with people like that, we're like, well, maybe you need to not go to this really difficult place you're talking about. (laughs) There's work that you can do for the Lord in other places, you know, places in Europe. We have great refugee work there. The Japanese are the second largest unreached people group on earth today. You could go work with them. Uh, So, yeah, we do kind of assess their ability to handle uncertainty and risk and then help them to find a good location to serve. Interesting. Pam, as we finish up, we always want to equip listeners to pray. So I'm thinking of I'm thinking of a lot of different people, but the the missionary who is in the process of making that transition, maybe it's their first year, maybe it's their first 18 months on the field. You've been there. How can we specifically pray for them during that sort of adjustment period? Yeah, during that first year on the field, I would pray for them to have grit, tenacity, and perseverance. I think grit is just the number one requirement for missionaries, which means having hope arise. That's what that means, that I may not have my breakthrough today, but that breakthrough might be tomorrow or the breakthrough might be 100 days from now, but I'm going to have hope arise that that breakthrough will come eventually. So I would pray for the grit, but also the hope to sustain people into grit, Mm -hmm. um, to stick it out for another day. And the other thing is that it's different than when I was a missionary, right? I'm not as young as I used to be. Um, You can communicate with your missionary. You can send them voice messages, which is what I do regularly. I just send a little voice message where I pray for somebody and I record that and I send that prayer to them wherever they may be. That is a fabulous idea. Yeah, so get onto WhatsApp or Signal or text messaging or however you communicate with your folks and not only just pray for them, but record that prayer for them. Of course, be aware if they're in a sensitive location that you may need to change some of your language or use a secure app. Uh, But I think it's really encouraging to hear the words of the prayer for the other person. Amen. Now let's, let's talk about somebody further down the road and maybe more broadly, missionaries, missionaries that our churches support, missionaries that we support, what are some just ongoing ways that we can pray for them? Yeah, there are so many ongoing ways to pray for people, but to stick with it for language learning. Language learning is really exciting for like the first, I don't know, three days <laughs> <laughs> for most people. And then after that, it just gets to be this long, grueling task that people often bail on because it's hard it's and hard. they move out into other work before they really ought to so that they would be willing to stay there and learn the language. The other thing I would pray for that people often don't think of is to, if they have children, to pray for their children. Um, missionary kids pay a cost in serving in missions that's not on the Excel spreadsheet, right? And often, if their children are not thriving, that family's going to leave the field. And I don't think that's even necessarily wrong. They have a responsibility for their children. So not only pay attention to mom and dad, but pay attention to their children as well. And the other thing I'd say is if your missionary is a single missionary, like I was a single missionary, you should challenge them. Like, who are you talking to? Who are you sharing your heart with? Are you taking vacations? Um, You should be taking vacations. Missionaries need vacation too. And if they don't have enough money, maybe you need to help them. Or if they're just like, I don't know, I'm a single person, but like, go join them. Take them on vacation and do a vacation together. Another thing I would recommend is if you're willing to take your Thanksgiving and your Christmas and go to wherever they are and spend Thanksgiving with them so that you can bring a holiday to them. And that just will sustain them through hours and weeks and months of maybe being lonely after that. But to pray for those things as well. Amen. As a former missionary kid, I echo the part about missionary (laughs) kids. (laughs) Uh, but, But so much good material We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Dr. Pam Arland. She is the Global Training and Research Leader for All Nations International. She's also the author of a brand new book, Stick Figures Save the World. The subtitle, actually, it's Jesus who saves the world. You can pick that up about sharing the gospel with very simple drawings that you can do that cross culture, cross language. Uh, Pam, thank you so much for sharing your heart. Thank you for being our guest this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Thank you. It's been great being here. 
I want to encourage you to visit All Nations' website. It is allnations.international, just all spelled out, allnations.international. We'll also give you a link when you come and visit us at vomradio.net. We'll also give you a link to purchase the book, Stick Figures Save the World. And I hope you'll be back with us next week as we continue to explore what God is doing all around the world and equip you to pray for people, for our brothers and sisters serving in far-off nations. Join us again next week right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.